it seems to be a little bit um, crazy for us, um, but that happens with formatting from time to time. Uh, but this is just a reminder of our overall framework um, that we had for the campaign, um, looking at uh, our approach through a behavior change lens. So we created this framework, which is basically a linear chain of action to result in a behavior change. So looking at a very specific single action, raising awareness around that, normalizing the behavior and establishing an environment where that behavior could be done really easily. Uh, and people are reminded to undertake that behavior uh, in a timely way. Um, so, Next slide, thanks, Harry. The way that we did that was we looked at um, the different preparedness behaviours um, that we wished to um, install in Queenslanders' lifestyles, um, and we decided to take a relatively um, easy approach uh, that would still have plenty of impact on a, a resilient outcome. Um, and as thus, we decided that that would be about picking up some items at the grocery store to add to your emergency kit. Um, Harry, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up my own slides um, and share my screen just because these ones haven't formatted quite correctly. So we're going to think on our feet for a moment and um, just change over if that's okay. Sorry, everyone. Not really sure what's going on with our PowerPoint today. We've had a few technological issues here at QRA. So I'm going to share my screen now, just in case any of those weren't showing up properly because it wasn't looking quite right on my screen. Um, share screen. Okay. Uh, I've done that thing. <laughs> Okie dokie. So everyone should be able to see that front page now. Is that correct? Thank you everyone for putting up with us. Um, so as I mentioned, we have our behavior change chain. Um, and I was just talking about how we were going to achieve that. So we were looking at raising awareness through some traditional media, um, particularly television, linear television, and of course, streaming as well um, to add into that and building normalization through people's social media feeds. That's where we like to see our friends and family engage um, in their everyday lives. And if those everyday lives include preparedness activities, then um, that you know instills in us that it's a normal normal behaviour that is socially acceptable to undertake. And we wanted to also normalise that by showing real Queenslanders in our advertising as well, not just, um, you know, our our heroes, our um, police or AMBOs or SES, but actually Queenslanders undertaking uh, the work and doing the job and making sure that it is um, achievable. In other words, it's easy. Um, and it's cheap because we all know that it's important um, to Queenslanders right now. Um, and the last part of that chain is around that environment and that timely prompt. Um, and that is why we did um, two things a little bit differently this year. We had, um, we invested in some out of home signage. You can see that's actually, um, I think, switch um, that sign outside of Woolies there just to remind people to grab those items before they go into the supermarket. So that timely um, prompt. And then on the left hand side, you can see um, a page grab from the IGA catalog during Get Ready Queensland week. Um, and that was about creating um, an environment where people could really easily undertake the behaviour. So we were really lucky to partner with them to do some in-store promotions, some point of sale prompting, um, some in-aisle advertising. Um, so that when people were at their local IGA, um, a really trusted community focused brand, um, then they would have everything they need uh, to undertake the behavior that we want, which was to purchase items for their emergency kit. Uh, so we went out across um, quite a few different channels and we were really happy uh, with what we were able to get in terms of 
our media buy. Essentially, uh, what we saw is that across each of those um, channels, we were able to exceed the benchmarks that we had set for ourselves, which was really, really good. Um, from the TV perspective, we really targeted that at um, the grocery buyers demo uh, demographics um, so that we were trying to really hit the people who had the influence in the household to undertake that behaviour. And we amplified that through a media partnership with Channel 7. So we had the creek to coast feature. We had um, a feature on um, like Channel 7 news, the, the, uh, the 6 p.m. weather, uh, which was really good as well just to um, amplify those messages. Um, and Meta, so Facebook and Instagram performed really, really well for us as well. And I'll get a, into a little bit more detail, um, but basically that newsfeed content was one of our um, most successful uh, channels for getting uh, our key messages out into the communities, particularly the 15 second version of the commercial and uh, the carousel of images as well, which was great. And YouTube was really good, particularly for young males which can notoriously be a difficult um, segment of the market to get, um, but clearly they're really engaged in YouTube. So we saw some really good outcomes um, from that paid advertising as well. So when uh, we looked at, um, I heard a question. Oh, someone's heading off. That's cool. Um, we have our results in terms of recognition of the campaign concepts. Um, so if you can see those little uh, green triangles, that means there was essentially a statistically relevant uh, increase in the outcome compared to previous um, campaigns, which is really, really good. We had an overall total recognition, uh, which means that people had seen at least one um, uh, one advertisement kind or pipe um, and recognized that um, at 58%, which was fantastic and a, a continuation on that increase that we've seen over the years, which is great. We want to keep improving in that space. And there was higher recognition among those 60 years plus and also females 45 plus specifically um, at 67 and 65 percent respectively. So that's that's really fantastic. Um, probably not a surprise that TVC was particularly impactful for the older generations, but also um, for residents that lived in Queensland for 12 months or more, they were statistically a little bit um, higher to be watching television as opposed to some of our um, migrant communities. Um, so those with past disaster experience um, were much more likely on average to um, recognise our social media campaign. So you can see the average there at 19%. Um, that still is an increase. But if we just look at the audience segment um, of people who have been impacted by disasters, that rises to 27%. Um, so obviously something is happening in that algorithm uh, with people who are engaging with disaster content online because of their previous experiences um, that enabled us to um, hit them quite strongly uh, with our social media campaign. And so those new elements, the shopping centre billboard that I just showed you and the IGA promo, um, they were really popular um, or really impactful I should say with um, 30 to 44 year olds, uh, which is a nice audience segment um, to target. Um, and those speaking um, a language other than English at home um, had a recognition of those IGA promos of 22%, which is significantly higher than the average, which I thought was really interesting. Um, it could be because of where IGA sits in the grocery market, um, as well as those with previous disaster experience and um, those who say they're uncertain about how to get prepared, they were also more likely to um, note those IGA promotions. Um, and so overall 10%, but when looking just at IGA shoppers, 20% uh, recognition, which is fantastic.
Um, and then we looked at how the campaign made people feel. Um, so really the response um, to those campaigns and to those campaign elements. And we were really happy to see um, some really nice numbers come through, um, you know, improving on previous years, but also just demonstrating that this new approach did you know, have impact. Um, people thought it was easy to understand. There was a significant increase in the number of people who thought it was a good reminder to prepare and, and gave the right information on how to prepare. Um, of course, that it was worth remembering is always a nice thing to be able to accomplish. Um, and then it does give the information that people need. So, um, yeah, I think just across the board, it was really nice to see some statistically significant shifts um, in the campaign impact. Um, and I think that is because of the, um, you know, the more lighthearted, relatable approach to disaster preparedness um, compared to something that um, may cause anxiety or cause people to switch off. Um, having that that lighter tone um, and making it easy and convenient, uh, obviously was able to hit the mark, which we're really happy with. There's always room for improvement though. 2023, bring it on. Um, so we asked what people thought the key message to take away from the campaign was. Um, and of course, get prepared um, was still up there with the, you know, the really top message. Um, but we did see a um, vast improvement, probably no surprise in people saying that the key message was to pack a kit. Um, we had uh, in our campaign brief, you know, mentioned that 8% from 2021 is saying we really want to improve on that. Um, and we can certainly say that we were able to achieve that this year, which is fantastic. Um, and then we also asked if people would actually undertake preparedness behaviours as a result specifically of this campaign. So then looking at people who both had um, already taken action because of the campaign or those who intended to take action because of the campaign. That's how we get to those percentages down the bottom under influence of behaviour. So we can see um, that the campaign you know, is having that influential effect in getting people to prepare a kit, um, buy new items for their old kit, make a household emergency plan and check their insurance. Um, so that's really great. We'll do some research. Um, Next year, uh, that's our every two year research, our statewide research that looks specifically at um, these types of behaviours and the number of Queenslanders adopting them. Um, and I'll be really interested to see if this campaign uh, is able to drive that kind of longer term change um, in this space. Um, so looking specifically at the partnerships um, that we had for the campaign this year, obviously IGA, that's quite a novel approach for Get Ready Queensland. Um, and the vast majority of Queenslanders you know, thought that that was a really positive partnership. Um, a few were neutral, but uh, very few were negative, which is great. Um, I thought it was quite interesting um, if we look at the fourth point down, those who saw the promotional materials, of those who saw promotional materials, 58% um, said that that actually led them to purchase kit items, which is really fantastic. Um, I can remember somewhere in the research, and I'll be sure to send you guys the full report, that that figure increases to 71%. Um, but I just don't want to give you a bum steer on what that was, how that calculation is made. I'll come back to you, but um, potentially that looks even better, which is um, I'm sure exciting news for IGA. Um, we asked why people didn't purchase as a result of um, seeing these promotional materials, um, basically already having the items, the items are too expensive or that they will buy later. Um, but overall, Queenslanders think that having checklists such as the one that you can see on the screen now is a really good idea, as well as having those sale items in store. Um, so yeah, I think that bodes well for the concept um, of a retail partnership. And then, 
looking ahead to um, our famous ambassador, um, Jonathan Thurston, again scored gold stars uh, for the work that he is doing at Get Ready Queensland. Um, uh, more and more people are recognising JT as the Get Ready Queensland ambassador, which is really nice. And more and more people are agreeing um, that he is the right person for the job, um, you know, particularly some of our older Queenslanders, females 45 plus or younger, I guess, um, and those who've lived in Queensland um, for quite some time. So I, he may not have perfect cut through, um, particularly for some of our um, migrant populations, for example, um, who didn't grow up with rugby league on their television every Friday night. Um, so Get Ready Queensland could probably afford to have a look at um, other uh, influences uh, that we could also lean on, but certainly um, just taking a broad brush approach, JT continues to have fantastic cut through for us. And, and we particularly see that from a traditional media perspective, you know, any media release we put out with a quote from JT is bound to get a run, which um, really helps us push that message out to Queenslanders. So um, yeah, we're, we're really lucky to have him do his fantastic work for us. Um, and then ultimately, we just asked people what they would improve if they could, um, so that we could, uh, you know, think about what we're going to do in the coming years. Um, happily, most people did not have any suggestions, which, um, you know, one could take to suggest that we had done a pretty good job in 2022. Um, but there were some emergent themes from those 5% who did make suggestions, including more detail on how to prepare or what to pack, the use of non-celebrities more prominently in advertising. Uh, we did try and strike a balance this year, um, but, but perhaps more can be done. Um, some people suggested increasing the emotional impact or shock value of the ads, but that actually goes against what the market research tells us. So perhaps that works for a percentage of Queenslanders, but certainly not for the vast majority all the time. Um, and airing ads more often or using other comms channels. So looking to continue to diversify um, the channels that we use to push out these messages. Um, but that's it. Are there any questions for myself regarding these results um, or any any other comments? Linda has a question. I will, I will try, try and answer, answer as, as much as I can. can. Hi Kate, how are you going? Great. Awesome. G'day everyone. So it's Linda Williams from Moreton Bay Regional Council. Um, Kate, I just had a question in relation to the IGA. You may, um, you probably haven't seen it because you've obviously you've been presenting, but I've just been putting some um, stuff down and had some responses. So um, we definitely put our hand up that we're keen to work with IGA, um, if not in Get Ready Week, you know, um, post Get Ready Week. Um, and we received no communication from IGA. So there was a little bit of disappointment around that. And so I'm curious to know then for 2023, mm. are IGA jumping on board again? Um, mm -hmm. And if they are, is that, um, you know, relationship Relationship. Can the state help us facilitate, I guess, more of um, buy-in for that? Because we're certainly keen yep. to do stuff if, yeah, we're able to absolutely. schedule it in with some time. No, so, thank yeah. you so much. Um, so a couple of things there. You're absolutely right. Um, I just um, finished uh, quite a lengthy evaluation report on this. So beyond um, just these market research results, but looking at how the partnerships are formed and how they played out. And one of the key recommendations if we are to move forward in with a partnership in the same sense is um, improving uh, our engagement and touch points with store management, because I was also disappointed just like you guys were, um, because uh, those activations were my idea uh, as part of what IGA could help us with um, but I think in terms of actual delivery we will let down and there's 
seemed to be a bit of a communications breakdown um, between us, IGA headquarters and the store owners. So I would certainly be looking for more opportunity to engage directly and, and help local councils um, find those types of opportunities um, for local activations. Um, in terms of whether or not uh, IGA will come on board, that's all still to be determined. I would certainly love to um, tweak this and give it another run uh, in 2023 to see if we can continue to build Build on these fantastic outcomes, um, but it takes two to tango. So watch this space. Uh, we'll certainly be having those conversations soon. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Kate. And if there's um, once I guess you work out the best way forward for us in local government, by all means, let us know whether we should be contacting, you know, the IGAs directly or a state. Let like yeah, however that absolutely that looks. yeah. Perfect. We'll Thank we'll you. put a we'll put a strategy in place. We'll get them. Lovely. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Any other questions or comments before I hand back to, oh no, I'll, this is my slide too. Yay. Okay, cool. Well, what we'll be sure to do is make sure that um, we can share the, um, the data more broadly um, with councils. So you can dig into the detail um, if you do wish and always come back to me with questions. Um, but now looking ahead um, for, this year, so those dates are weird, but anyway, um, we have a few priority areas this year that we're hoping to achieve. Um, so I'm really interested in reviewing the Get Ready Queensland website. Um, as you guys probably know, most of our comms point people to the website as their source of information and then they're linked out to fantastic council disaster dashboards or other sources of um, subject matter expertise. Um, but over time our website has gotten a bit cumbersome and it doesn't have a fantastic user experience. I was lucky enough to work with Morton Bay on um, a, a piece of work re relating to accessibility and I looked at the Get Ready Queensland website looked at through a web reader and it was lost basically all functionality. So I really want to work towards a more accessible and inclusive website. Um, and as part of that, also refreshing our brand guidelines, which councils will be um, interested in seeing the result of because that might impact how we utilize our beautiful brand that you can see on the screen there um, on um, collateral or billboards or anything that that councils want to use. I really want some really clear advice and great examples of, of how the brand can be placed um, on collateral. So that would be fantastic. I also want to diversify our image and video library, um, you know, make sure that there's a beautiful suite for metropolitan, regional, rural areas so that everyone has access to impactful imagery for their digital comms or their printed comms. Um, we all know that, you know, pictures are so important these days um, to try and get that cut through in a really busy space. So I want to help councils out as much as possible. Um, you guys have told me that it's something that you want and I am um, going to try and deliver. The other thing we have on um, at the start of this session, um, Harry mentioned that we now have Sally on board as um, our principal comms and engagement officer, and she's specifically here to deliver our flood campaign. And so that's um, uh, going to be rolled out under um, some uh, special funding that was a result of the um, flood events that we had last year. And it's specifically um, to look at how Queenslanders um, perceive their flood risk and act on that uh, and trying to influence positive behaviour. So we'll be going out um, quite soon to look at um, doing some research to plug some knowledge gaps. We've looked at a ton of information um, from Red Cross, Brisbane City Council, IJAM, et cetera. Um, and we've learned so much um, thanks to that work, but there are a few questions that we still have. And so we're gonna go out to community to try and find that info. So we'll be sure to swing back around. Um, that campaign will specifically um, be delivered into the 39 uh, impacted local government areas. But what I'm hoping is that um, that campaign can then support um, a more broad uh, engagement and communications around all hazards. So um, even though it's a flood campaign, I would love to get bang for buck and look at something that is applicable um, both elsewhere in Queensland and to other disaster types. And of course we have our 
usual get ready Queensland fun and games, um, including the Resilient Australia Awards. Watch this space because um, applications or submissions um, for those awards will soon open. Um, and we really encourage uh, as many of you as possible to think about what projects you have done or that you know of that would be um, eligible for those awards under those seven different categories. Uh, we'll provide plenty of information on that and we also provide support for those applications as well um, so we want to we want to put the spotlight on Queensland as doing good stuff um, and I know a lot of you out there are so um, put the effort in um, uh, to, to apply for those awards we'll have get ready Queensland week way later in the year but it's not too early to start thinking about what type of activities uh, we will be doing uh, for Get Ready Week and I am talking to some councils already about the work that they want to do which is just fantastic because October will be here before you know it. Um, in terms of a launch date we will talk to our friends at BOM. Obviously we align with the BOM outlook every year. Um, I suspect that um, the second week of um, October will be the same old, same old. So I believe that's Monday the 9th this year. Um, so that's what all our planning is, is um, going towards that date. Um, and then we'll also be opening our school competition soon. So again, we will send out um, plenty of information um, and that if you do want to help us by getting um, that information out to your local schools, then we always appreciate the support. Um, so it's going to be a great year. Really looking forward to it. This is just some of the highlights. There's plenty of other work happening in the background, um, but the fantastic thing about these meetings is that we can keep you all up to date. Um, as we progress throughout the next 12 months. Fantastic. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Kate. So before I get on to our guest speakers, let me just give you a quick reminder that the acquittals are due for the previous financial year grants. And um, for this financial year, please be sure to spend um, by the 30th of June this year. And also, um, just give a heads up, we are working on the new guidelines, which are currently being being drafted at the moment. And if you need any help, of course, please contact us or you can contact your RRO as well. Okay, thank you. And now I will hand over to Tammy Hunter and Tamika Tihema from the Bureau of, of Meteorology. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Kate. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I just want to yell out and a big shout out to the Get Ready team. Great results for 2022, and I'm looking forward to working with you guys in 2023. Um, before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm on the lands of the Butchula people um, up on the Fraser Coast, um, just across the road from Gari, which is a fantastic spot. Um, and I also have Tam with me today, who's uh, the Bureau's climatologist. And I'm my teams or the Bureau's teams have been going a bit cray cray today. I'm, I don't think, don't know if it's the whole system or just our system. So I'm going to put myself on, um, I'm going to turn my camera off in a minute. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show um, two, vid two short videos, one of the climate and water long range um, forecast for January to April and the other one, um, as you would have known, we've just gone through a heat wave, so understanding heat wave uh, warnings. So if you just bear with me while I turn my camera off and share my screen. Uh, include sound, yes, and Hopefully this works. Welcome to the Bureau's long range forecast for February to April 2023. Weather the normal conditions are likely to continue in much of the north and parts of the east coast, but drier in the southwest. First, let's look at recent conditions during January. Widespread rainfall and severe storms affected most of northern Australia in early January. A number of areas have also been drier than usual this month, including southeast Queensland, western Tasmania and parts of the top end. Extropical cyclone Ellie brought intense rainfall leading to significant flooding in western Australia and the Northern Territory in early January. 
heavy rainfall mid-month also led to flooding in north queensland and the central coast between townsville and rockhampton more than one meter of rain fell in one week in sites around mackay flood waters in the murray and darling rivers continue to impact parts of western new south wales and south australia large areas across the north had cooler than average temperatures because of the thick cloud cover some sites in Queensland had their coldest January days on record, while parts of the south and central regions had heat waves with unusually hot weather for three or more days in a row. High rainfall has kept soils wetter than usual across much of the north, while parts of the west and east are currently drier than average. Water storages overall are 8% higher than at this time last year. Many are more than 100% full. Exceptions are Tasmania, where storages are down to around 54%, and the southwest coast of Western Australia, which is around 57%. So what's likely to influence our climate over the coming months? La Nina is easing in the tropical Pacific Ocean and is likely to end in February. Even as La Nina weakens, it will continue to influence our weather and climate for some months. This includes increasing the likelihood of tropical cyclones in our region. Severe storms and active monsoon bursts do occur at this time of year, so please be prepared. The long range forecast for February to April shows above average rainfall is likely for parts of the east. It is the wet season, so northern Australia typically has high rainfall this time of year. It's likely to be drier than usual for southern parts of Western Australia and South Australia in coming months. Higher than usual stream flows are forecast to continue for much of the north and east. With more rain likely in areas of wet soils, high river flows and full dams, the risk of flooding remains. The outlook is for warmer than usual days for most areas, particularly for the southwest, the far north and southern areas, including Tasmania. Nights are also likely to be warmer than usual across most areas. Parts of the south have already had heat waves during January and there's an increased risk of more to come. Hot nights during heat waves make it harder to recover from the heat of the day and this puts more stress on the body. Bushfires are always a risk in summer. Heat wave conditions add to the fire danger and fire agencies are closely monitoring areas of above normal bushfire risk. Recent wet conditions have led to abundant vegetation growth and that can also increase the risk of grass fires. So in summary, from February to April we're likely to see above average rainfall for parts of the east but dry in the south and west, continued flood risk in some parts, warmer days and nights for many areas, above normal bushfire potential for some areas, and an increased chance of tropical cyclones. You can find the latest long range forecasts and warnings on the Bureau's website. Bye for now. Okay, I'm, I'm hoping that worked and I wasn't just sitting here watching it by myself. It was great. Thanks. Oh, it worked. Yeah, yeah it worked. <laughs> thanks. Harry. Great. I was like, I'm, I'm hoping everyone's watching this and it's not just me by myself. Um, the next one um, is a, a short um, one and a half minutes and that's around understanding heat wave warnings, especially what we've just gone through. I know that um, I was exhausted the last, in the last week with the the humidity and the dew points up in um, on the Fraser Coast. So um, bear with me again. And I'm getting a bit of a guru at this sharing video business. So just bear with me. In Australia, heat waves cause more deaths and illnesses than any other natural disaster. The Bureau of Meteorology issues warnings for severe and extreme heat waves to help Australians prepare for and reduce the impacts of extreme heat. A heat wave is when the maximum and minimum temperature is unusually hot for a particular area over a three day period. We consider these temperatures in relation to the local climate and recent weather. Heat wave warnings are issued for two types of heat wave. Severe heat waves are orange and they're likely to be more challenging for vulnerable people such as the elderly particularly those with medical conditions. Extreme heat waves are red and they are rare. They're a problem for people who don't take actions to keep cool, even those who are healthy. A warning is issued when a heat wave is forecast within the next four days 
and shows areas where heatwave conditions are forecast, as well as the expected intensity. A heatwave warning consists of four maps, each covering a rolling three-day forecast. You can see here how the maps are staggered, each covering a three-day period which overlaps with the next. A warning includes the expected maximum and minimum temperatures, the timing of when the heatwave will peak or ease, and the affected communities within the warning area. These warnings help prepare Australians for heat and provide advice on how to stay safe. For more information about the Bureau's heatwave warning service, visit bomb.gov.au forward slash Australia forward slash heatwave and be sure to check for the latest warnings via the Bureau website and weather app. Awesome. I'm pretty happy with myself just sharing that. So <laughs> that's really with teams and everything that goes on. Um, that was pretty much all I wanted to um, share with you today. Just where we're still in the middle of our um, planning for 2023 um, in the community engagement team. But if anyone had any questions now, um, if I not, have I have a question yep. for you, Tammy. So yes. I'll just jump right in. Um, that video was really great explaining the heat wave uh, warnings. Um, is that how are you sharing that um, publicly? Um, so we're sending it out to all our stakeholders to, for them to send on so um, councils and um, other organisations to send on to the community um, and that's coming out this week. We have also have um, Tam online who who's just put something in the um, – oh, yep, she's just put the overview of the video online. Um, oh, so, yeah, we'll be great. sharing those videos with our stakeholders so that they can pass them on to the – to their communities. Legend. There she is. There's Tam. Hi, Tam. <laughs> Great work. Hello. Yes, I've just popped a link in the um, the chat. That's got our Outlook and the videos are in there. Um, and any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or you can send them through to Tammy and we can answer them for you. Thank you. Thanks, um, Kate. Thanks, Harry. And thanks, Tam. Thank you so much, Tammy. That was a those are great videos and we will be sure to share them on our socials once we get them. And now um, we have Jenna Buckley from Toomba Regional Council who would like to talk to us. Are you online, Jen? Hey Jenna? guys, yeah I am. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh brilliant. I have no end of tech trouble with my headsets. Um, apologies after Harriet asked me if I would like to present. I went on leave so I didn't get my powerpoints done so I went uh, to death by powerpoint um I believe uh get ready asked um, me to speak about our multicultural disaster ambassadors um we nominated and were successful at the Queensland Community um Resilient Australia Awards last year so that was fun didn't get to go to Hobart for the uh international one I mean the national one, um, but I wanted to just quickly talk about how we came about to have our ambassador program and where it's going from here. Um, so funnily, it started when my district XO handballed an invitation to our local level alliance meeting in um, early 2020. <laughs> um, I ended up meeting a lady, Jane Williamson, um, who had taken on the CAMS position um, with Mercy Community Services. She's also the local level Alliance coordinator. Um, and we got to talking and as you know, in 2020, we ended up with COVID. So a few of our community service meetings um, fell away when we weren't able to do things face to face. They weren't able to um, ramp up their technology to support virtual um, until later in the year. Um, so beginning of 21, Jane approached me and said she'd like to apply uh, for a grant related to disaster preparedness for multicultural communities through the Multicultural Affairs, but it needed uh, some financial contribution. So she was talking with me and I was able to commit uh, some of our Get Ready Queensland funding to preparing resources in the shape of our evacuation document wallets. Um, but with quite a few of the different stakeholders, we came together and come up with a bit of a concept of what 
the need was. Um, Toowoomba has a welcoming communities um, level acknowledgement under the UN. Um, we do have quite a high migrant and refugee population as well. Um, fortunately, we were successful in applying for that grant. Um, so with support from council, as in myself, and from Red Cross, if anyone knows Antoine, um, he drove up from Brisbane once a month. We put on monthly training. Now to fit the um, ambassador's schedules, we put it on after hours, so, so six till nine o'clock at night on a Thursday. Um, one of the key things for our um, ambassadors is a lot of them are involved in a lot of initiatives um, and it does take a toll on you know, their livelihoods. Um, it costs money. Hey, <laughs> that's a photo of some of us. That's Jane up the front. I just um, grabbed these from your uh, your submission um, from yeah. RAA so <laughs> people can see the great work you're talking about. Um, I even had photos of your know, QLDRRA lights. Anyway, um, so one of the big things was um, not taking advantage of our ambassadors, I guess you'd say, not that we were. But um, so part of the funding went towards providing um, them with like we'd give them vouchers, fuel vouchers, Coles vouchers, that sort of thing for attending for the three hours. And we also catered um, some of the best catering I've ever had in my life. Um, we had a local uh, Thai slash bakery. Anyway, that wasn't the point, but it kept me coming. Um, so our first night was held with just a broad invitation going out through all our networks. Um, we had about 33 people put an expression of interest in covering 25 nationalities. Um, in order to cover them with insurance and all that sort of thing, they were inducted as volunteers under Mercy's program, which was quite handy. Um, and then we had our schedule of training. So one Thursday every month, either myself or Antoine or someone we'd invite come in. So things like emergency preparedness, we took them through the ready plans. We introduced them to psychological impacts, disasters, and the idea of supporting and leading community led activities um, before, during and after. Oh, this is our Arabic um, flyer that they've got up on the screen. Um, what we found when we presented them with the wallets, so we wanted to train them up um, on the messaging, who's who in the zoo, how they can support their people and advocate for them before, during and after an event. Um, we provided them with the document wallets and it became um, pretty clear from the feedback. It isn't so much that our community members can't speak or read English, it's that they can't read in their own language. Um, so we moved to a different version of the wallet that we workshop with them, which was more picture based. We used the icons for the evacuation kits um, and then had simplified English, um, which is up on the screen. We then created a flyer which was translated with a bit more information. Um, these, these resources actually became quite popular with some of our, um, like the TAFE, the English lessons because they like having things in one language and then the English version with it. Um, so quite a few of um, the students there have snapped them up. Um, also as a dual purpose aside from the disaster side of things, um, these wallets have been um, found to be quite useful for domestic violence. Um, so a lot of those service providers can enter a home, give the I person suffering from domestic violence, one of these wallets, because it doesn't, you know, signpost domestic violence. So they can actually prepare um, their documentation and other things before they leave the home. Um, from there, we continued from May 2021. Um, we had um, a couple of trainings that were postponed due to COVID. Joy's COVID brought us even as far as last year. Um, and um, we continued training um, and then we ended up celebrating in about, it 
ended up running late because of the borders opening. We were meant to have it in December 21. We ended up having it in, um, I think it was March last year. Um, but from there, um, the LDMG um, endorsed that the um, ambassadors become a member of our local disaster management group um, as a support member. So um, at the moment, Jane's attended, but we'll be rotating it through our ambassadors. Um, with the feedback about not being able to read in their own languages, we're moving um, on with a multicultural video series. So a bit similar if anyone remembers what Sue did with um, Seneca and Cairns, but ours is gonna be a generalized message, not about cyclone safety, um, which we're going to use the ambassadors for, for our five most common languages. So we're angling for the vulnerable community. So um, our most common language after English, I think it's um, Mandarin or Filipino or something, but through our ambassadors, we're told that communities, those communities have a good grasp of English. Um, the ones they're more worried about is Kurdish um, and a few of the others. So we're also rolling in our hard of hearing community as well. So there will be a video where someone is um, interpreting into Auslan as well as closed captions because not all people who are hard of hearing can speak Auslan. Um, also, we're about to start planning for round two. So our next lot of ambassadors, but with our previous ambassadors, we're still um, communicating with them and keeping them engaged. Um, and we're going to be working with a few of them on cultural awareness training for our staff. A lot of it's around our evacuation center planning because um, one of them pointed out to us something I didn't realize was um, Azidis don't eat lettuce. So <laughs> anyone who has Azidis communities, which may be evacuated into an evacuation center when they're being served meals, more than likely there's going to be sandwiches with lettuce on them. Um, not just lettuce, you've got um, all the other dietary religious requirements. So yeah, um, that's short, sharp, hopefully that's all. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jenna. That was amazing. Um, and just before we head off, since we have a bus. Oh, hang on just one sec, Harry. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Jenna and sorry. the work that she's done? <laughs> um, sorry, Jenna, I'm throwing you back in. Hey, um, Jenna. So I'm Jo from Ipswich. I'm actually looking at developing a, well, trying to develop a similar programming concept in our area with um, called community leaders. Would you mind if I potentially grabbed your details and picked your brains in a couple of weeks? Do you say your Ipswich? Yeah, certainly yeah, am. Yeah, just ask Maddie. <laughs> oh, nah. No. All right, thank you so much. I'll dob, I'll dob him in. Last time I did that, <laughs> he ignored the other person, so. That's all right. I'm happy to throw him <laughs> under a bridge as well. Cheers. Thanks, Brilliant. thanks, mate. Uh, and Leah? Yeah, um, um, that was a really great um, uh, talk about the work that you're doing. Do you have... Um, is it possible to get access to that submission, just like an overview? Um, I know that Cass Ryan, who's heading up our public information and warnings area, we're looking at warnings for all project and um, it'd be great just to get some more information about your, um, your project. Uh, sure, I'll just put my email address in the chat if that right. helps. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. I'm sure you'll get plenty of attention, Jenna. Um, I see that James, you have your hand up as well. Yeah. Hi, Jen. So when I was up in town, so I did create um, this, the video series um, as well as, you know, the, the print stuff as well. So, so yeah, there's quite yeah. a lot of learnings from doing the video side and how much extra is needed in that um, doing I it in language rather than the. Keep yeah. saying when they're like, you know, it's so innovative. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's just I'm the first person down here to do it as in yeah. you know in Toowoomba. And it was the, and it was the same up there as well um, and our comms team up there they completely underestimated just how difficult it would be um, yeah even just during the filming See, and then all the post-production as well how many extra steps are involved in post-production 
yeah, when you're having to go through and do all that. You know? One of our ambassadors, whilst she's a, so, when we had our ambassadors, they were actually um, like Australians. We actually had one Brit as well. So, um, but they've all got their own connection. So Jenny Ricks is her name. She's involved up in world studies or something at university here, but she's also one of the managers or the head manager of Bonjour Toowoomba, which is <laughs> our languages school. So um, I think they can have coverage of 22 languages as well. So we're pretty fortunate here in terms yeah. of scriptings. But yeah, um, yeah when you um, have a look at a lot of the stuff that's been put out, like our emergency action guides and that sort of thing, it's very uh, one race centered. So yeah, the, the, the videos came out them. awesome, but it was a similar thing. Um, we had them talking on it, but we also put subtitles and then we also had to animate it because some of the languages they said, OK, well, we've got that word in our language, but no one's going to know what it means because it's so obscure in our language. Yeah. So then we highlighted every word in the script that they weren't familiar with and that's so we had to animate it all as well. And so it just turned and into regional this. dialect is yeah. another one yeah. um, or uh, Arabic because there's even three just different the, even Arabic. just a teleprompter, the teleprompter would not work in Karen. Um, and so we even even her just reading off the script on the video was was interesting that day. But yeah, yeah, really interesting. Wow. There's so yeah. many learnings, and I think anyone on the line who is um, pursuing this type of task, I think it's really great that um, you know we get together to talk about uh, what's happened and those have forged the path before us. Um, I if we have two minutes left, and so I'm wondering, I do have a question on this. Uh, for Jenna and James, um, just to think about kind of the end of the the process. So obviously we do a lot of engagement and consultation and we invest in these videos, but ultimately I'm curious to know how these videos have then be, been promoted and what the take up has been from the target audiences. Of course, there's no point having videos if no one's watching them. So I'm really curious just to get that end part of the process. Well, we're only at the beginning, so I'll let James speak <laughs> and I'll write notes. <laughs> um, I, I suppose, yeah, we did videos because, like you said, Jenna, um, although they might be able to speak in language, a lot of them, they learned their languages in refugee camps, so they might not be able to read it. So the fact sheets are great, but maybe they can't read. Um, and so that's why we did the videos. The videos were also because um, the way I would communicate with our group, um, it was obviously led by them and right at the start, um, the humanitarian settlement team, they said, OK, they typically um, they communicate via WhatsApp and they don't want to have email addresses. So we had to create a WhatsApp group and that's how I and that's how I communicated it with all, all these people. And um, because of that, uh, the video is specifically made so they could be shared on things like WhatsApp. And actually, when we was in the final stages on the draft version, um, we had a cyclone warning come down the coast. And, and even without asking, they then started sharing that and sending those videos to all their, their communities and their friends. So that's how that worked. And that's that's particularly why it was there. Obviously, it's on the council website and YouTube as well, but it was actually designed so that the community himself could share it, how they normally communicate with each other. And we're hoping to integrate QR codes on some of our flies as well. Mm. Yep, that's Just it. Yep. On the, on the fact sheets we had, on. the fact sheet yeah. then had QR codes which went to the video. So even if they had the fact sheet and had mm -hmm. the stuff, it would also link to the video again as well. If there's a silver lining to the pandemic, it's the uptake on and understanding our QR yeah. codes. People now know what a QR code is, yeah. <laughs> We're putting them on our signs and maps and all so, sorts. Yep, posters, everything now. So. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, great answer. Appreciate it. OK, um, before we go, does anybody else want to share um, about the project or any events that they have coming up or have worked oh, on? Harry, I think in the interest of time, if anyone okay. does have any information um, that they want to share back to the group, reach out to Harry and I and we'll add you onto the agenda for the next meeting. We've had so much great um, information to talk about today that we've uh, 
come up against our deadline. Um, so I just want to take this opportunity to thank you all for uh, taking part in our first community of practice for 2023. Really looking forward um, to keeping everyone up to date uh, with the year and, and hearing the amazing work um, that's happening right across the state. Um, I'm excited to see what you guys get up to. So don't be shy. Uh, thank you very, very much. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Harry. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye.